My name is Stephen Darwall, and I teach philosophy at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. And today I want to discuss morality and God. Is God necessary for morality? Would anything be right or wrong if God did not command or prohibit it? In Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, the character Ivan says, if God doesn't exist, then anything is permitted. This is a version of the view that is sometimes called the divine command theory. The divine command theory holds that morality just is God's commandments and prohibitions. If there were no God who commands us to act in certain ways, then nothing would be morally right or wrong. Actually, strictly speaking, nothing would be permitted either, despite what Yvonne says. The categories of moral right, wrong, and permissibility simply wouldn't apply. This is the view I want to consider. I'll be trying to illustrate how the truth of two assumptions, one, that God exists, and two, that it's morally wrong to violate God's commands, do not imply, three, that moral right and wrong just consist in God's commands and prohibitions. And to make this especially vivid, I will show how if one believes two, that is, that it's morally wrong to violate God's commands for certain reasons, then far from that implying the divine command theory, it actually implies that the divine command theory is false because it implies that there must be truths about moral right and wrong that are independent of God's commands. First, however, let's notice some reasons that one might be attracted to holding the divine command theory. One is that it explains the close connection between the idea of morality and that of law or requirement. What is morally wrong to do is not just what there are good reasons not to do. It is what one is morally obligated not to do. That suggests that morality is a kind of law, and the divine command theory can explain why that's so. God's commands create the moral law. Secondly, the theory also explains the contrast between any earthly law or any society's mores or morality and what we might call morality itself, or morality with a capital M. That is, genuinely obligating moral norms or the truths of moral right and wrong. Consider, for example, Huck Finn's quandary in Mark Twain's novel Huckleberry Finn, which is set in Missouri before the Civil War. Huck has become close to Jim, who is a runaway slave. Under the Fugitive Slave Act, Huck is legally required to turn Jim in. And Huck believes also that according to the moral convictions of his time and place, he's morally required to do so as well. Indeed, he thinks that God's commands require him to do so, and that, as he says, he'll go to hell if he doesn't turn Jim in. But feeling a profound bond with Jim as a fellow human being, Huck simply can't bring himself to do so. Now, obviously, Twain is assuming that his readers will agree with Huck's expression of common humanity and disagree with Huck's belief that it would actually be morally wrong not to turn Jim in, even if they also agree that this would be contrary to the morality of the antebellum South and Missouri. What makes the novel so powerful is that despite himself, Huck seems to sense that morality doesn't actually prohibit. In fact, that it may actually require, or at least recommend, that someone in his situation violate the fugitive slave law and oppose slavery, since slavery is a morally evil institution. The divine command theory can explain this distinction between morality and any society's laws or mores. Although Huck thinks that God commands us to return a runaway slave or always to obey the law, we may think that God does not actually command that. God commands that people oppose slavery. The divine command theory is an attractive view precisely because it can explain our sense that morality transcends any earthly law or social understanding. Still, that doesn't show that morality is the same thing as God's commands, in the sense that if there were no divine commands, then nothing would be right or wrong. To see this, let's assume again that one, God exists, and two, that it's wrong to violate God's commands. And let us consider different reasons we might have for thinking that it's wrong to violate God's command. Suppose you think we should follow God's commands because God knows better than we do what we should do. If that's your attitude, then you're treating God as what philosophers call an epistemic authority. You're believing something on God's authority, on his say-so. That is, because God believes it. 
This is a natural attitude to have. We frequently believe things on others' authority. If a friend of yours knows much more than you do about the law of Missouri in the 1840s, then you might reasonably be inclined to believe something just because she does. But her having this epistemic authority would not mean that she has the kind of lawmaking authority that can create law. Her thinking something was the law would not actually make it the case that it was the law. To the contrary, her having epistemic authority would itself depend on there being independent truths about the law in the 1840s in Missouri, of which she has knowledge. So by analogy, if your reason for thinking you should follow God's command is that God knows better than you do what is morally right and wrong, then it would not follow that God makes the moral law. To the contrary, it would follow that there are independent truths about the moral law of which God has knowledge. So if that were the reason to follow God's commands, the divine command theory would not be true, it would be false. Or suppose you think you should follow God's commands not because he knows the moral law, but because he knows what is good and bad for us, not in moral terms, but just what would make us better or worse off, what would benefit us or harm us. But if that's your reason, must you not be assuming that it is true, independent of anything God commands, that morality must somehow concern what promotes human well-being and prevents suffering? So here again, if this is why you think you should follow God's command, you must be assuming that there are facts about morality that are independent of God's command. Or suppose you think you should follow God's commands because God has superior authority over us, something in the way a sergeant does over a private or a legislature does over its citizens. This reason does avoid the problem that afflicted the last two. Such authorities really do seem to be able to make it the case that something that would otherwise not have been required or forbidden in itself is required or forbidden just because they forbid it or require it. So if God has authority of this kind, then he can make something right or wrong through his command. But notice that the only way authorities can create requirements or prohibitions in this way is if it is already true that we ought to do as they command. It's only because the sergeant has authority over the private that the private must do as the sergeant commands. In other words, the fact that the private must obey the sergeant can't itself result from the sergeant's command. That has to be true independently of anything the sergeant commands. So by analogy, if the reason we should do what God commands is that he has superior lawmaking authority over us, then it must be true that it would be wrong to violate his commands quite independently of his commanding it. And if so, the divine command theory would be false. Or suppose, finally, that you think you should do what God commands because you love God, and we should do what those we love ask us to do. But here again, if that's your reason for thinking it would be wrong to deny God obedience to his commands, you must be assuming that it is right so to respond to the wishes of those we love, and that this is true independently of whether God commands us to do what those we love ask us to do. It seems, then, that if we think we should do what God commands for any of these reasons, we must also assume not that God is the source of morality, but to the contrary, that God cannot be the source of all of morality. In each case, we must assume that there are moral truths that are independent of God's commands. So we must assume that the divine command theory is false. Now, we could avoid all of these problems if we were to think not that we should follow God's commands for any of these reasons, but just because of God's omnipotent power. But then we would lose the contrast between God's power and his authority and his goodness. We would have to see his commands as simply imposed on us in a way that does not obligate us morally, but rather that obliges or compels us by force. Just as law in general cannot be created by pure force, so neither can the moral law. It's logically impossible for morality to result from force.